Hi, good morning. So um, we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is the MR evaluation for mitral twin. So here are my disclosures. So the objective of the talk will be to review the indication for mitral clip. We're also going to discuss the caveats of the echo assessment of the MR severity. We're after going to look at the specific and key information we need um, on the pre-procedural uh, TEE and TTE to assess for patient eligibility. And we'll finish with an interesting case. So, um, the first MitroClip was implanted in 2003 and it has been commercially available since 2008 in Europe and 2013 was FDA approved for degenerative uh, mitral, valve, mitral regurgitation and then um, later in 2019 it was approved um, for functional MR after the COAP trial. So throughout the years, the clip itself has gone through a different series of evolution and uh, improvement in both the delivery system and the different features of it. So currently we use uh, the generation three uh, devices, which are the NTR and the XTR. And since uh, December last year uh, at St. Max, we also have access to the fourth generation clip uh, which are the NTW and the XTW. W stands for wide. Uh, that new clip it has a width of six millimeters compared to four millimeters from the third generation to allow um, a, a bigger bite of the leaflets. So uh, the mitral clip is made of uh, cobalt chromium and it's coated by polyester to improve uh, tissue healing and it is uh, MRI safe. You can see on the bottom right here uh, an NTR and an XTR. So the smaller clip, the NT, has a, a clip arm of nine millimeters and the XT has an arm of 12 millimeters. So um, throughout the years now, we have a lot of good quality data to support the use of this technology. On this slide, you can see the four uh, major trials that uh, have been published. So these four trials are uh, randomized controlled. They're large trials. Um, they are all CoreLab adjudicated data. So it allows us to support really uh, the use of this, this, this technology. So all these four trials have shown that the clip was safe and it was uh, effective to treat MR uh, in very um, highly selected patients. Uh, outside of these trials, there's a large uh, TBT registry, mainly US sites that also uh, have results that goes through the same, um, that have shown the same benefits. So what are the indications for mitral clip implantation? So for uh, degenerative MR, patient has to be symptomatic, have moderate and severe or more MR, and who are at prohibitive risk of mitral valve surgery. For functional MR, patients have to be symptomatic despite being on optimal medical therapy. They have to have at least moderate to severe MR, and have an LVEF between 20 and 50 percent and an LV and systolic diameter of less than seven centimeters. The contraindications are the following. Patients who can't tolerate anticoagulation, mainly heparin, during the procedure, or who cannot have a dual antiplatelets for one month after the procedure patients who have uh, active endocarditis, patients who have underlying rheumatic uh, mitral valve disease are contraindicated. And if there's uh, on the screening echo, a presence of any intracardiac thrombus, we will um, either delay the procedure or, uh, or not do it on that day. So is the mitral clip safe? Um, 
I think now the data all points towards yes. So the most uh, recent data, which we would call contemporary data, comes from the global expand trial. And um, in this trial, it was multicentric uh, around the world, more than 400 patients. And the implant success was a staggering 99.5%. So if we compare to the Everest two trials in the early 2010s, the success rate was around 95%. So we can see in 10 years, there have been a great improvement in the operator skills, but also uh, an improvement in the device itself. So in this uh, trial, we have a single leaflet detachment uh, in about 1.9% of patients and leaflet injury in a very small number of patients. At 30 days, the all-cause mortality was 2.4%. Uh, that's pretty low, given these patients are quite sick. And at 30 days, most patients have what we call procedural success with an MR of less or equal than two in over 80% of the population, who started off with uh, you know, significant MR. In all these patients and in all these trials, there was also a significant improvement in their NYH class compared to baseline. So what about functional MR? So uh, we have uh, talked a lot about this topic for the last two years now. Um, you can see here the, uh, from the COAP trial, um, the result has shown a significant improvement in their all-cause mortality at two years. Also, there was a significant improvement in rehospitalization for heart failure after the procedure. Um, so this is very interesting. As we know, most of these patients are, um, you know, we are, you know, recurrent and we see them often on the, the wards. Uh, heart failure itself, being hospitalized for heart failure itself is a feature um, of, of uh, poor prognostic. And surprisingly, remember also in the mitral affair, they did not show the similar result in this trial, which were a priori um, same type of, of patients. We did not see this benefit. There was no difference between the two arms, the medical therapy and the mitral flip uh, group in terms of all cause death and rehospitalization. So a lot of people were scratching their heads and trying to figure out why um, these two uh, studies had different results. And um, that led to Dr. Grayburn to come up with this concept of a proportionate and disproportionate MR. So um, the bottom line is that what we notice in the COAP trials, patients with severe MR tend to have smaller left ventricle but more significant MR as measured by the EROA. And these were, are now called disproportionate uh, MR patients. Whereas in the mitral FR patients, the LV volumes were much larger and the EROA were smaller, um, letting that this is now called proportionate MR. And we think that the MR in these patients is more a bystander and a, and a result of their very sick underlying um, LV disease. So um, fixing the MR as it is a better standard may not um, result in, in increased survival because they're so sick from their ventricles. So taking it uh, one step further, uh, Dr. Graeburn published this this year. He wanted to see if there was a way to have a numerical cutoff for what we would call proportionate and disproportionate. So looking at all the subgroups from these two trials, he came up with this uh, new ratio, which is the EROA divided by the LV in diastolic volume, and looked at all these separate groups and who actually benefited from uh, the clip, as you can see on the right side here from this hazard ratio. And he came up with um, a most discriminative 
ratio to decide which patients are proportioned in this proportion with 0 0.14. So keep in mind though, this uh, has not been studied prospectively. This was looked in after. No group um, has used this criteria at baseline to see if patients would benefit but, uh, from the clip, but I'm sure in the next years, this is something we'll be talking about. Um, and, and perhaps we'll get some interesting results from this, this new concept. So um, for pre-clip uh, pre uh, screening, both on transthoracic and on TEE, it's important to look at different aspects of the valve. So the first thing we have to look at is the mechanism or the etiology of the MR as well as quantify the degree of severity of the regurgitation. So for this, uh, we have um, the ASC guidelines to help us with this. So as you know, um, for chronic MR, we, uh, the guidelines suggest us to go through this algorithm and classify the patients within different groups. So this algorithm is based on both qualitative and quantitative uh, measurements. And it's based on the presence or absence of a number of these criteria. So for example, if a patient have four or more of these uh, criteria listed here, the patient will, will most likely have mild MR. At the other end, if patient have four or more of these criteria, which we are defining severe MR, such as the presence of a flail, a large uh, vena contracta, a large PISA radius, a wide jet, presence of uh, systolic flow reversal, and enlarged LV. So most likely this patient will have severe um, MR. So, um, and if you don't fall in any of these two extreme um, criteria, then anything in between has different cutoffs for EROA, regurgitant volume, regurgitant fraction, and we can grade the patients according to that. So the problem is with this algorithm is that um, sometimes we get discordant findings. So in, in the lab, we see this every day, um, sometimes the criteria, we do all of them, all these eight criteria, and it's all over the place. So it's hard to kind of really decide um, how severe the MR is um, and having to decide because clinical decisions or management of the disease is really based, or a lot of it is based on the degree of severity. Of course, we can go forward and do an MRI in a TEE to help us and see if we can find concordance with these other modalities. But so, so, but there's something to, there's something more we should learn about this. So my question looking at this algorithm was, how frequent uh, do we get discordant results with those criteria? And once we have discordant criteria, do we know if any criteria weights more than other ones and how can we work around it? So uh, this is what I want to discuss today. So uh, Dr. Gillam and her group have published these two very elegant studies looking precisely at this topic. So the, the most recent one uh, is the top one that's called Concordance and Discordance of Echo Parameters Recommended for Assessment of Severe MR. And in a few years ago, she also published this one um, which is titled A Comparative Assessment of Echo Parameters in Determining Primary MR Severity Using MRI as the Gold Standard. So what do I mean by concordance? So here's an example, and this is from, the, from her paper. This patient has what we call concordant parameters. So this patient had a flail, had a flail segment, on 2D image has a very large PISA radius. Um, the profile is very dense. Um, the EROA was measured at 0.5 centimeters square, a regurgitant volume of 91. 
you can see here the jet is very wild, covers the whole LA, the left atrium is dilated, the LV is dilated, the E velocity is high, the vena contracta is 0 0.8, there's systolic flow reversal in the veins. So all of those eight criteria points towards the same thing, towards severe MR. Some other patients can have discordant findings, and this is an example. So this patient here, you can see the PISA radius is less than one. The ERA is only 18 centimeters square, and the regurgitant volume is 33. However, the left atrium is dilated, the ventricle is dilated, the vena contracta is large, and there is also systolic flow reversal in the veins. The E velocity here is kind of on the higher side, or not quite 1.2, but kind of on the higher end. So these are what we call discordant findings. So what she did, um, so she took 156 patients with different degrees of MR. So every single study was uh, reviewed by an expert, experienced echocardiographer. So the, uh, this echo echocardiographer has measured all those measurements as suggested by the guidelines and have used their personal experience and integrated all these findings to come up with the classification of what they feel was the true degree of severity. And this is somewhat considered at the gold standard in the study. And they were classified as being definitely mild, grade one, grade moderate, grade moderate to severe, and definitely severe. So um, about, they were about divided, uh, about a third in each group. So once they've done that, they went back and looked at precisely those eight criteria from the guidelines and have used the AAC algorithm to reclassify or at least see if the data was consistent with um, the group they were following into it. So for example, here in the definitely mild group, 75% of the patient had no discordance in their findings all the eight parameters from the AC guidelines and using the algorithm, all the criteria points towards a mild disease. At the other uh, end, in the moderate to severe group, you could see that 81% of the, the patients had what we called high discordant group. So even though the expert um, uh, echocardiographer had put all integrated all these findings together and used his experience to rate it as being moderate to severe. But if you take it individually all these criteria, the eight criteria, you can see that there was a, 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 very, a great variability in, in, the, um, in the cutoffs or how they would be otherwise classified using purely the algorithm. So as this was kind of busy and difficult to look at, uh, the group came up with this concordance score. So basically, the score is if the data, the eight parameters of the data was consistent uh, within each patient, they would have a high concordance score. And if there was a lot of, uh, if they lacked concordance or, there, or if there was a lot of discordance between uh, the eight variables between one patient, they would have a low concordance score. So you can see here in the mild group, there was a lot of concordance. All the data was concordant within each patient. And in the higher um, MR groups, there was not as much a concordance within the parameters. So um, they wanted to see, well, knowing that, is there a way on these, with these parameters, can we increase the concordance score in these um, high degree of severity groups? So what they did is they looked specifically or integrated only the PISA EROA, the PISA regurgitant volume, and the vena contracta, looking only at these three criteria. Um, and I'll tell you later why they chose those three, but they saw that by integrating only those three, it tend to increase the concordance in those high-grade groups. 
So it wasn't perfect, but overall it did increase the concordance in each group and especially in the higher groups. So you can see here in the predictors of concordance, uh, these parameters, tend, these uh, following parameters tend to increase the concordance within the group. So you will ask why did they choose these specific three quantitative measurements? Is because of this previous, the other study they published a few years ago, looking at the correlation of each individual uh, echo parameters with the gold standard, which was a CMR. I, if I remember correctly, I think this, this study had 120 patients, if I remember. And um, looking again at each of these eight parameters, such as seen in the guidelines, they saw that the PISA your way, the regurg volume in the vena contract that correlated the best with MRI. So by integrating um, all the parameters or all the criteria from the guidelines, uh, they got at, at most a moderate correlation with the gold standard. So I think these are our interesting findings. So the take home message from these two studies is that we can't use solely one criteria to grade the MR severity. Um, it's just not possible because of, the, because of all this discordance uh, within each patient. So the best way is to mix both, uh, well, personal experience as well as this algorithm approach as suggested by the guidelines to grade it. And if you were to choose um, some um, quantitative parameters, well, possibly the PISA EROA, regurgitant and volume, and VINA contract that together seems to uh, be the most concordant. So we can discuss this uh, after the talk if anyone has any thoughts on, on these concepts. So, um, so I will add to that that uh, quantitative assessment is quite important, but what's the most important is looking at the underlying disease on 2D or on 3D and see if that pathology can lead or it doesn't make sense that it leads to um, MR. So for example, if a patient has a large flail segment with a malcoaptation gap of six millimeters, um, even though the jet is very eccentric and hard to see, most likely this patient would, will have severe mitral regurgitation because the leaflets are abnormal and there's a large malcoaptation gap. The same for a patient with FMR who has a very large ventricle, a tenting height of 15 millimeters, and a tenting of the posterior leaflet that is such that it's almost immobile, that results in a malcoaptation gap of five millimeters. So for sure, even though the jet is not well seen, it is most likely, again, that this, this mechanism of MR will lead to severe natural regurgitation. So um, panning through both the transthoracic and the TE and looking at the 2D defects is, is crucial for uh, evaluation of, of the MR um, etiology. So uh, before the procedure, now we spoke about uh, evaluating, evaluating the degree of severity and the mechan underlying mechanism. Now let's move uh, forward and look at specific contraindication or potential challenges um, the anatomy leads us for the procedure. And also while we look at that, we'll also plan for the procedure. We want to know if um, it will be safe to place clips at certain uh, places in the heart, which clip we're going to choose and make sure we have all the orientation views to allow the steering and the guidance during the procedure. So um, we tend to classify uh, the cases in uh, green, yellow, and red uh, for their degree of complexity. So on the lower and uneasy case would be, uh, for example, a patient with an A2P2 prolapse with no calcification of the leaflets, with a, mitral, a large mitral valve area of more than four centimeters square, with a low gradient at baseline of less than four millimeters, with a posterior leaflet of more than one centimeter, 
to allow a lot of room to grasp. If it's a functional MR, the coaptation depth has to be less than 11 millimeters. If it's a DMR, the flail width should be not too wide to allow a good grasping and taking care of all the pathology with the clip. And the flail gap has to be less than one centimeters. At the other spectrum, when it's a red case, well, it's pretty much the opposite. If there's a presence of a cleft, if there's severe calcification that goes into the leaflet, if the mitral valve area is small, uh, less than 3.5 centimeters square, if the gradient at baseline is high, if the posterior leaflet is very short, it will be a challenging case. Uh, we really shouldn't be doing rheumatic diseases or for patients uh, with very severe Barlow's disease, uh, that also, um, it's possibly best served by a surgical approach if the patient is, is, um, is suitable for surgery. And very extreme cases, either very wide uh, regurgitant jet or a very dilated amulus with a lot of cordae are something that we tend to stay away from. And anything in between is, is um, to be discussed during uh, rounds. So here's an example of a green case. So this is a, you know, a P2 flail uh, with a malcoaptation gap of about three millimeters. So this is a patient that we tend to be easy, very roomy, large atrium. And at the other spectrum here is a patient um, who is not such of a good candidate. So um, he's hemodynamically unstable. Uh, you can see here there's severe calcium that invades the leaflets. There's a large malcoactation gap. So this case is, is a red case. So uh, what are the key information that we need to assess for a patient's eligibility? So we need to, uh, like we said, uh, understand the underlying mechanism of DMR. We need to know if there's the presence of uh, clefts and fold. Like the example here to the right, this is a 3D view of um, the mitral valve and you can see on the 2D image, it wasn't that obvious, but once we put on the 3D, you can see here, there's a presence of a cleft on the medial side. Um, mind you, we have um, done procedures on patients with cleft. We usually put two clips kind of in a triangular shape uh, from each side of the cleft. So it is doable, but it's nice to know uh, ahead if this happens. So we need also to grade DMR uh, severity using quantitative um, parameters. We'll need to know the posterior mitral length. We'll know the size of the gap. We want to know if there's calcification of the annulus. We want to know if there's calcification of the leaflet themselves and of the sub uh, mitral apparatus. We want to know what the baseline mitral valve mean gradient is. We want to get a mitral valve area. So in the uh, Everest time, uh, when the, we didn't have the 3D capacity on the open machines, we usually get it from the transgastric view, kind of like we do for a tricuspid clipping. So from the, tri from the transgastric, it's pretty good. It tends to overestimate what we get from 3D. And the reason for that is that from the transgastric view, because we only have one plane, we don't have the full plane. We don't know precisely at, if we're truly at the tip of the mitral valve leaflet or not. Um, so that's why it's, it's a little bit challenging. So nowadays with the 3D capacity, it's very easy to obtain like on the right side, a good 3D view and then um, do the multi-planner, uh, view the MTR views and position ourselves really at the tips of the leaflet to get a, an accurate um, a mitral valve area. And even if the heart is tilted, uh, we can adjust the planes to make it so we're truly at the, the leaflet. So that's, that's a great um, improvement in our imaging technology. And lastly, the last information we need is to know if there is an intracardiac 
from this, either in the LAA or, or anywhere else in the that they chew on it. So uh, if you're only gonna get one view um, for to plan the procedure, you should be getting a good bicommissural view and um, activate them the um, explain feature of the machine to plan to the valve. That is the most important view. So the explain view or the bicommercial view starts with the bicommercial view, which is here, as you can see on the green uh, arrow. Um, so this allows us to see the whole, the whole valve um, and then uh, make us have a, a, good, uh, a good view of it. So you can see here on the right side, we get a good, a good bicommercial view. And by putting the explain um, on it, here we put the cursor on the medial aspect of the valve, we get this view. So we can easily pan through the medial to the lateral aspect of the valve. So when we put the cursor here, uh, we get the medial side of the valve, A3P3 on this view. When we move the cursor to the central of the valve, we now get uh, visualize A to P2 on the on the um, on this view here on the right side, and when we move it further to the lateral aspect of the valve, we uh, are able to view A1 P1 and looking for the pathology and where the regurgitant jet is coming from. So after we do that, then we can do a good 3D view of the valve in real time, a single view acquisition. We, uh, by convention, put the aortic valve at 12 o'clock. So we can see the smiley face of the mitral valve here. And the lateral aspect of the valve is on the left side. So this is the surgeon's view looking in the mitral valve from the left atrium. And in this patient, you can see the P2 prolapse with the flail segment here. So, so it, in a glimpse and with a one click, you can see the whole valve in real time, see it moving and you can pan through the whole aspect of the valve. So this is a great way to do it. So by doing the X-plane views pan through by 2D with very high uh, frame rates and then confirming our findings with this 3D view, uh, then we have the whole information and we can make uh, good decisions based on that. So I will uh, finish the talk with a, an example. So this is a lady uh, I saw on Monday uh, for her follow-up. So she's uh, 89 years old. She has hypertension, chronic AF, dyslipidemia, and CKT. Uh, this was uh, two years ago, she presented to us with uh, NYHA class three symptoms. She's been recently hospitalized for heart failure, uh, which was due to a P2 flail. Her creatinine was in the 200, she had elevated nt BNP. Her SDS score was calculated at 8%. So uh, her right left half showed uh, elevated LA pressure with B weight of to 63. So um, this is uh, the TEE view. So this is the cursor. So this is our uh, bicommissural view and we've put the cursor in the central of the valve. So you can see here there is a P2 prolapse and every other beat you can have the hint that there's a flail segment here. And when we put color on it, we can see it's very impressive regurgitant jet that is very broad. Um, and looking at the 3D, we get this beautiful view um, of this P2 flail. So looking at the measurements, we got a posterior uh, set of 15 millimeters with a malpartition gap of four. The vena contracta was 0 0.8, and the PISA ERA was 0 0.69 centimeters square with a regurgitant volume of 87. The mitral valve area was adequate, 4.9 centimeters square. The time rating was two, and there were no uh, LA thrombus. So other views we took on T, we see here, confirms the severity of BMR. There's a high E velocity. There's a big malpartition gap. 
and their systolic flow reversal in all four pulmonary veins. So her case was discussed at rounds and because of her high STS score, she was deemed non-surgical. So um, the pathology was feasible using mitrophic, so that's what we did. So we start all the procedure with this transeptal puncture. Um, this is the intraitral septum. This is the superior vena cava. This is the inferior vena cava. So uh, we're doing a trans, and this is, sorry, the interior aspect of the valve and the posterior aspect of the valve. And we're doing this transeptal puncture, ideally um, inferior and posterior um, on the septum. So when we're happy with where our needle is, then we can measure the, the height um, of, of this puncture, which was here at 4.4 centimeters. So good height, so it will allow us to steer uh, comfortably the, the device down to the valve. So once we uh, do the transeptal puncture, we put in here the delivery device. You can see here, this is a wire. So we position it in the LA, then we bring the clip down. So this is again, is the bicommissural view. This is medial lateral, and this is posterior anterior. So once we bring the clip down, we try to orientate the clip so it faces down towards the valve. In the central aspect of the valve in this case, because the pathology is as ATP2, uh, you can see here, for example, the clip has a lateral dive and a posterior dive. So we'll, with this image, we know that we need to strain the mouth of the, the clip, sorry. So once we did that, then you can see now on this view that now it's straight up and down on the valve and we can do a 3D to confirm our position that is truly in the central aspect of the valve. And you can see here the clip arms that are oriented um, 12 and six o'clock. So once we're happy with the positioning, then we deploy the clip. So you can see here the clip is deployed and it's very mobile. So you can see it's bouncing around. There's a lot of residual prolapse still. And when we put color on it, there was a lot of regurgitating jet left. So we decided to put a second valve, which is, a second clip, which is we're bringing it down here. And once it's deployed, this is what it looked like. So you can see the medial clip here and the lateral clip here. You can see there's residual prolapse here between the two clips. Um, and you can see here on the 2D views, uh, notice how, how much residual prolapse is left of the posterior defect. So when we put color on it, we were actually quite happy with this result. There's not much regurgitation to inject. And we can see here there was a significant improvement in the veins. All four reversed, were reversed, and now all four, all four of them are systolic dominant. And to confirm this, the V wave uh, went from 63 to what, 27 or something. So there was a significant reduction in V wave, a significant improvement in the pulmonary vein, and uh, an improvement in the visual of the problem. So we were pretty pleased with that. So what we like to do in these cases, especially when there's a clip and there's a lot of shielding, or if we suspect that there's an eccentric jet, uh, we like to do a 3D um, view of it to really access it and you can see this was quite helpful in in this case that we were able to see that there was a small uh, residual MR which kind of makes sense because we saw that there was residual prolapse. So here are the results uh, post. The mean gradient we had we got the two clips in was five and um, with mild residual MR but there was residual so when you take a last shot of the heart, there was no pericardial occlusion and the LDF remained normal. So the patient uh, went home and I saw her uh, on Monday, then she uh, was feeling unwell. She um, uh, had a, a recurrent um, symptoms of heart failure. So on the echo, this was kind of bad news. You can see here there was a complex jet uh, going in different directions. So when we see that post clip, the first thing we want to know is, are we having a single effect attachment? Is one of the clips fly out, go away? Is there any other complications? So 
we can see here on the two on the two chamber that we can distinctly see the two tips one and two and they're what we call dancing together so this kind of goes against one we said that could be detached so let's do other views to check it out from the short axis view again we confirm that the two tips are still attached to the match value fit but we see a lot of mobility here on the posterior side and when we put color on it we can see here there's uh, that residual jet fuel and no color coming here behind the, behind the tips. So from the four chamber view, this kind of confirms that there's a lot of mobility to both clips, but they don't have independent motion, which is kind of reassuring. And then you can see here the residual jet. So, um, so what happened is that um, What's thought the tips are still attached, uh, but because of that residual prolapse um, that we left, then the time grew and then the MR got more severe. So we uh, tried clipping, we tried clipping, going back and putting a, another clip on that residual prolapse uh, to, to treat it as she is not a surgical, or still not a surgical candidate. And uh, it was a non implant. Uh, we weren't able to. Uh, to clip it um, safely, or when we did, uh, the gradient across the valve went from four to almost a nine, so it wasn't an option for her. So uh, we're currently treating her medically uh, with diuretics, and we'll see how it goes uh, from there. So in summary, I think we can say that mitral clip um, is a safe and effective way to treat both EMR and FMR. And it's very important to have an accurate mitral valve evaluation uh, before the procedure to look for complication and, of course, assess for eligibility. And how can we do that? For sure, we need to use an integrating approach using both our personal experience and also uh, supported by the uh, ASC algorithm to grade DMR severity. And uh, it's important to obtain all those key uh, nine elements of the T and the TTB before the procedure uh, for a good planning for the future. So I'll stop here and uh, thank you for your attention. So thank you, Geraldine, this morning for giving us such a comprehensive review of uh, your experience with much of our um, uh, procedures. I think this is one of the uh, special areas that we have. And uh, uh, thanks to you, thanks to Neil and uh, many of our uh, interventionalists as well as our echo colleagues like Kim and uh, Jeremy who has been really involved in developing this program for us. So now we've become like one of the referral sources uh, in the city or GTA and, and uh, greater areas and that's really good for St. Mike. So thank you. Um, can you tell us more about your like our experiences so far? Like, you know, how many patients yeah. do you screen and how many patients actually get the clips and um, what was the waiting time? So just sort of general sort of situations uh, where we're at with this procedure. So uh, last year and 2009, well, the, from July 2019 to now, we've done a total of 86 mitral clip cases. Um, so from which about, I think, 10 are combined cases, both mitral and tricuspid. We treat both half and half. So almost half our FMR, half our DMR, with a little bit more DMR throughout the years. Um, so... Uh, Waiting list currently, well, because well, COVID has uh, kind of made it so different, but we are usually able uh, to clip the patient uh, urgently, as inpatient for sure, or uh, definitely within a month of referral. So uh, for the degenerate, so every single case is screened and, um, uh, and reviewed at um, valve, uh, valve rounds every Mondays. Uh, for functional MR, we uh, try to follow co-op uh, guidelines and make sure they're on optimal medical therapy for at least six months before considering the procedure. We often uh, refer to um, the heart failure clinic and Dr. Mo, it's been very helpful to us. And, um, and, and that's, yeah, that, that's about it. The, the thing that are with us is that we get a lot of second opinion uh, cases, people that have been turned out for uh, anatomic reasons, and um, we, we screened also. We have a, a kind of a mixed bag of, of different type of diseases, uh, but our success rate is quite good, over 82%. 
Um, we looked at outcome up to one year for this previous year, and, and it, we did uh, a fairly good job um, for that regard. So. That's great. Can, can we, uh, before I open this up to other people, can you just um, define the uh, DMR and FMR? Maybe some of our colleagues uh, on the call may not be familiar with these uh, acronyms. Okay, uh, so DMR is degenerative mitral valve uh, disease, so it's leaflet disease. It's mainly prolapse, uh, flail, um, well, mainly prolapse and flail, really, for, for in, in this case. And FMR is functional mitral regurgitation. Those are tenting of the mitral leaflets. So thank you. So what, yeah, degenerative is actually the leaflet itself is a problem. I think uh, DMR actually stands, uh, um, that's degenerative. And then the functional one is not the leaflet's fault. It's actually the things around it. For example, the ventricle or dilatation of the ventricle, or displacements of the pet muscle, et cetera. I think that's what... Um, some of the definitions out there. So, um, any other people or uh, colleagues have questions for Geraldine Ger uh, today? Very quiet this morning. Everyone has been very patient with your presentation. It's it's Bob. I'll ask a question. Uh, great great presentation, uh, Geraldine, and really exciting work. Um, PISA. Uh, as a major assessment criteria. I mean, PISA sort of, for at least accuracy, assumes a circular orifice. Mm -hmm. And in the, in the setting of mitral valve disease, it's pretty unlikely that it's ever circular. Um, so I'm just curious as to why you think the, the two PISA um, measurements were the ones that turned out to be the most predictive. Oh, that's a that's a fair point. Um, so PISA, I think, in the in the you know with the AHA guideline and the uh, you know with this this little controversy about you know when they changed the cutoff and it kind of led to so with with M with MR, I think there's like two aspects of it is a bit of how severe the MR parameters are and how the MR impacts the hemodynamics of the heart. There are kind of two aspects to that. And uh, so PISA uh, uh, perhaps seems to, even though it's flawed and has these uh, abnormalities in how we measure it, seems nevertheless kind of touch these two aspects of the disease. And maybe that's why it seems to be more accurate. So, um, it's hard to say so but by looking but looking at the 3d euro ways both like comparing let's say the mitral and the thickest um we can fairly get a a round shelf with the mitral when we explain the the pisa shelf into uh the the range of his its width and its length usually tend to be closer than than the tricuspid for example so maybe it's not that off you know what I mean, uh, but I, I, I can't I can't explain it more than we are observing that it seems to be a good reflective of of the degree of severity of the disease. Bob, it's uh, Howard. So uh, I think I think the points about PISA I think are well recognized. It's, unfortunately, it's still probably the 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 both the the best and the most validated quantitative measure um, that we can use. I guess the good news is that it, 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 in general, it, 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 because the shell tends to be, to be flattened, um, if anything, um, it probably underestimates the EROA. So if you have a, if you really do have a, 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 um, a large piece of radius, uh, um, uh, I think it, it, it tends to be more specific. I guess is, is my, is, is what I would say, um, because it does tend to, to flatten out, as we know. Um, and to Geraldine's point, I think if you if you look at if you, if the data is good enough for 3D euro uh, way, that may may end up being the best. Um, it's just a matter of how many patients you're going to be able to do that on. Wouldn't you say, Geraldine? Yeah, I agree. Geraldine, you you mentioned a couple of the parameters in terms of um, assessing um, suitability for clip, including the flail gap and the flail width. Um, mm -hmm. Perhaps you could just clarify for for us the 
flail width and how best to measure it because I, I think flail gap i think most of us are comfortable with uh, flail width tends to be a little bit more i would say subjective uh, could you give us some hints it is subjective and i think it's best seen on on the 3d so the width is the you know the, mainly comes back to if we need to put one clip or two clips so um like this one for example the width is this measurement here right so yeah. and we know a clip like a, a regular nt is four millimeters so if the gap here tends to be here like just looking at it, it feels like we will probably need to put two two clips and when we put the clip in it's look pretty similar so this gap this width is probably around eight millimeters so we were able to put two clips on it is that the like width width of the prolapse or like like is it or you use it actually the, the use prolapse. color to measure that this measurement oh i see okay so you have more than one scallop then the width will be really wide like if it's p1 and yeah, p2 for and example, then yeah. wider and wider okay but you use, you use 2d or, or actually only 3d to do that uh it's easier to see on the 3d like this one you yeah. can see on this one it's it's wide okay thanks for clarifying yeah that. it's um it's kim here um yeah i totally agree gerald and i think a lot of the width and gap stuff came from the original everest trial and it's it's wouldn't you agree geraldine we we're not as concerned about that now with the newer generation of clips which can be you know have longer arms and the, a greater width that was more of a concern with the original sort of clips there so it's it's probably not as important as it used to be it'll be i guess important for the strategies uh, strategies yeah. so are we putting uh given the valve area and the baseline gradient are we putting and then T or an XT, so those are four millimeters. But can we put two XTs if the if the collapse is very wide, or will we have to put an XT and an NT, or can we get away with one wide XTW? So it's kind of yeah. Whereas in the past it was more a contraindication, you know, if it was too too yeah, wide, yeah. then it was thought you wouldn't be able to. But with newer technology, we've got a lot more tools tools to play with so right. that is yeah so that's why we don't make as much of a of a of a, a song and dance about it in the original reports to be honest it's more a visual and then we usually pretty much by default use the wider the ntw xtw which is the ntw is the wider clip um, uh, for most cases and you can get away with it yeah yeah certainly we don't measure it routinely in the in the pre pre-procedural keys the width and Geraldine, sure database, Geraldine, yeah. So uh, actually, uh, funny you say that because we were we in follow up. We had the feeling that um, since December, since we've put in the G4 devices, we had the feeling we had more a uh, residual MR at follow up. So we kind of had that feeling, but we didn't look at it. So I looked at it, uh, the data, and um, it wasn't true. So we we thought maybe because we were putting wider clip, we were putting less clip. And maybe the this, the result wasn't as durable as when we put like let's say two two uh, G three uh, generation three clips, but um, that turned out not to be true. So why it's important to look at our uh, our result data and, and mm. see that make sure we're we're treating those patients right. Actually, that uh, that that okay, reminds okay. me that. Uh, sorry, Brad. Go ahead. Are you, are you sure you can finish your thought? No, no, no. You go ahead. Um, I, I just wanted to to ask one question, Geraldine. And in, in the PISA measurements, both in those studies you presented and when when you are doing them, are is angle correction routinely done? No. Okay, that's helpful. Should. And I guess simplifies. Should it be done? And do you think it would help you and change your, your data such that it would perhaps change your strategy or, or you would actually do something differently or do more patients or well, I, no? I probably not because then again, when we, we are, do our global assessment, we, we do a, what we call that integrative approach, right? So we support our, our statement or we support our grading based on 
on different aspects. So no, I don't think it would change. Tell you the truth. Great, thanks. And sorry to interrupt, Dr. Leong Boy. No, 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 no problems, Brad. I was just thinking that you know maybe a, maybe a future rounds. I'm not sure if Gerald Lee will want to tackle it again. Is 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 the assessment of severity of mitral regurgitation post clip, which I think all of us find extremely mm -hmm. challenging on trans thoracic and even on trans esophageal echocardiography. And there was that guidelines published by the ESC. I think it was um, about a year ago. Yeah. Yeah, Howard, uh, we don't okay. need to worry about that here because we never have any more than mild or trace <laughs> after our clips. So <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that's what I thought. Uh, but uh, yeah. <laughs> it all depends if it's if it's Dr. Fan who's looking at the echo. <laughs> it's like the surgeons, yeah. only excellent and shitty results. There's nothing in between. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's a great, it's a great point. Um, <laughs> Uh, you so, know, we're often a bit more more helpful in that, you know, at least intraoperatively, we have the left atrial pressure as a direct measurement. Um, and, you know, usually when we see greater than 40% reduction, we're pretty happy that this is going to be a significant reduction in the degree. Uh, but we've all been sort of caught out where the, you know, utilizing color um is is problematic i i think the yep. reduction in left atrial pressure follows very nicely with change in pulmonary venous flow um you know when you go from reversal to then systolic forward flow so there's a few things like that but you're absolutely right how we get aros and eros yeah it's, oh, it would be a great, great rounds yep yep so part of my ignorance um is this funded by the ministry now or is actually still out of um uh, foundation money yeah it's funded Excellent. Do they do they have it's an upper limit? Yeah. Do they have an upper limits of how many they funded a year or? Uh, yes. Uh, well, we 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 we, uh, we try targets. Yeah, we're we're in the eighties now. Um, yep. Let me see if I can pull up the funding. We, we got funded for one hundred and two the fiscal year. Wow. We did one hundred and four, but we got funded for one hundred and two. I remember correctly. Well, we were. We were able to um, um, to to cross budget lines, so I'm just pulling up the. So next year we're funded. Technically, we're funded for 90 clips for uh, 2020 2021. But as Geraldine was saying, we exceeded that last year. But we're able to fund across um, envelopes. So if we're under, if we didn't, and we didn't meet our targets for PCI, so. Uh, we could use some of that PCI funding for clips and tabbies. Yeah, and does that apply to the tricuspid or is it actually only on the mitral side? Only on the mitral side. For tricuspid, the only way we can treat them, well, we will be able to treat them is to ideally enroll them in the triluminate um, randomized control trials, clip versus medical therapy. Right, that, that's yeah. what Tim talked about last week. So thank, thanks for clarifying that. So I guess timing is 9.01 or maybe a little bit more. So. Once again, I want to thank you for this very comprehensive review. We will be recording it. So next year for people who are doing the uh, pre-procedures for transthoracic and transesophageal, uh, for people going into the uh, uh, mitral valve uh, intervention, uh, then you can review this uh, video and uh, go back to all the essential elements. And, and Geraldine and, and Kim and, and Jeremy will show you how to do it uh, in the TE when, you, uh, when the, our new ECHO fellows come and join us. So um, once again, just want to make one more announcement. Next week will be the last presentation of the year, uh, I believe. And uh, I think uh, we're going to bring back to Brian and uh, Magdi, um, as in the tradition, to celebrate and thank you for the hard work. And also uh, to uh, have them tell us a little bit about uh, what their future holds and what they have learned, etc. This is a tradition that we have for a number of years. And then uh, we'll try to present them with uh, some memorabilia as well, virtually and physically. Okay. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Geraldine. Thank you, everyone, for joining Bye. this morning. Nice talk, Geraldine. Bye. Great talk. Thanks, Geraldine. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.